Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Rendezvous, a program created by Dr. Rhonda Chervin. My name is Louise Walkup, and I'm the moderator for today's program. On our panel today are Maria Smith and Dave Basconi. We're all friends of Dr. Rhonda, and we're all trying to grow in holiness and love. On this weekly program, we dis- discuss and explore ways of growing uh, in holiness, and we do so by looking at one chapter or so every week from a book written or edited by Dr. Rhonda. So as you know, we're currently discussing Dr. Rhonda's little booklet called Give Me Your Heart, Preparing for Eternal Life. This book contains excerpts from the spiritual writings of Charles Rich. And if you'd like to look at the book, you can get it free of, free of charge at Dr. Rhonda's website, www.rondacherviin.com. Just click on books and the listing of all her free ebooks appears. So just scroll down the page and you'll see it there. Um, so this book that we're discussing, uh, Give Me Your Heart, is a compilation of wonderful quotations arranged alphabetically by topic. So if ever you want to quote on a particular subject, just look through the book in alphabetical order and it's easy to find. Um, So uh, let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, we ask you to pour your blessings on Dr. Rhonda and her family and on all our wonderful listeners and on our panel. Holy Spirit, please inspire us with thoughts that will help all of us grow in love and holiness. And we ask Charles Rich, who's smiling at us from heaven, to pray for all of us and to help us grow in the love of Jesus while we meditate upon and discuss his writings. Okay, so today I just wanted to mention that it's the feast day of St. Teresa of Avila, uh, so it should be a wonderful day, hopefully, for all of us. St. Teresa is the nun that, with the help of St. John of the Cross, reformed the Carmelite order. When she stepped into this order, it was very, very lax to the point of being almost luxurious if you were a a rich nun. So St. Teresa and St. John worked together, and they reformed it and um, did an incredible job. Mm -hmm. Um, And St. Teresa is also known for her closeness to God, uh, rising spiritually in the spiritual stages of life. She passed away in 1852 and was named a doctor of the church in 1970. And I wanted to mention St. Teresa of Avila's name because whenever I think of St. Teresa, I always think of Dr. Rhonda. Uh, And I say this because Dr. Rhonda really loved St. Teresa of Avila. And when she lived at Holy Apostles, um, the first time I met her, I noticed a little sign on her outside door that had a reference to St. Teresa's interior castle. And some of Dr. Uh, Rhonda's philosophy of life comes from St. Teresa, which is why um, some of us have heard Dr. Rhonda often repeat the famous quotation by St. Teresa, which is, Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things are passing. God is unchanging. Patience, gets, uh, patience gains all. Nothing is lacking to those who have God. God alone is sufficient, close quote. So in other words, if we have God, we have absolutely everything we need. We don't need anything else. Uh, we need, Of course, we need patience to obtain all things, uh, but, but we lack nothing. If you have God, you have everything. Um, God is the way and the truth, and God shows us the way. He shows us what to do. The Holy Spirit floods us with God's love. It's like, what more can you ask? And um, I wanted to make one comment about St. Teresa. She had said that she would have progressed so much faster in her spiritual life if only she had recognized 
the significance of her venial sins. Her confessor uh, kind of like poo-pooed the venial sins. He didn't think too much of them, but as time went on, St. Teresa realized that she needed to rid herself completely of um, of all her venial sins um, and, and to work on her, her flaws. And after she did this, then her spiritual, her spiritual life just mushroomed uh, and went to heights that we've hardly ever seen. So on this vein, I'll, my opening quote, which I, we always have an opening quote from Charles Rich, uh, will speak to this topic. Um, the quote comes from Charles Rich's biography, Hungry for Heaven, which Dr. Rhonda wrote. Uh, and I'll read four sentences from this. The, the first sentence is from one paragraph and the other one a few paragraphs later, but it all ties in. And I, and I quote, God only shows himself to us if we take the risk of trying to be holy. John of the Cross um, says, not to be attached to graces for our only security is his mercy. Quote, we should love God in his naked essence, not just for his gifts. That is why God allows us to go up and down again in the spiritual life. Close quote. So I thought I'd open with those um, quotations from St. Teresa of Avila and uh, Charles Rich. So it's always a surprise for Maria and Dave what what we start out with in the morning. So I was wondering, Maria, if you have any comments on St. Teresa of Avila or or the quotes or something that happened this week or Chapter 8 or Chapter 9, disgusted or doubtful from the book. Yes, um, St. Teresa is one of my absolute favorite saints. Um, She really didn't get started in her spiritual life, really, until she was about 40 years old. I know that at 24, she had a, a somewhat of a conversion experience, but from 24, or I think maybe that was earlier, and then from 24 to 40, I believe she said she lived more of a lukewarm life, just really happy to, you know, pray very little and to socialize and to, in the convent, while she was in the convent. But at age 40, she really got an awakening and she started to really um, be very fervent in her spiritual life. I have some quotes that I really love from St. Teresa. and. um, And a couple of them are on prayer. One of them says, for prayer is nothing else than being on terms of friendship with God. And she also says, mental prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than an intimate sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. And this also goes in with spiritual friendship among people. And I believe we spoke about this last week, about how having God and religion and spirituality in common brings people ever so much closer than anything merely worldly can do. And then for a quote from Charles Rich, um... The devil wants us to be dissatisfied with ourselves and to want to be different than what we are and so to make us restless, content, discontented, and unhappy. God doesn't care about your imperfections. I mean, he does want us to improve. This is a, a sideline. He does want us to improve. But if we focus our imperfections and stay away from God, That is not going to help us. It's going to hurt us. Instead, if we take St. Teresa of Avila's advice and spend time with God, be there with him, show, you know, be there just the way we are, he will help us to get better, to become holier, to let go of the venial sins that we are attached to. And so that's all for me for, for now. Oh, I love all those quotes. I don't know very much about St. Teresa of Avila, and I remember when seeing, um, uh, when, when going to Rhonda's for the first time at Holy Apostles, um, she had spoken to St. Teresa and had a, had something on her door. I think it said interior castle, 
And in the back of my head, I said, oh, I've got to read a book on St. Teresa pretty soon, and, and I still haven't gotten around to it. Um, and, and Dave, do you have, uh, how was your week like, and do you have anything you'd like to share with us from the opening quotes or um, the disgusted chapter or the doubtful chapter in uh, Charles Rich's book? Uh, yes. Uh, the week was, as usual, busy and uh always some unexpected things show up, but that's called life, and uh, by having faith, we deal with it and keep a positive attitude. Um, I actually have a quote uh, from the chapter, Doubtful, and this is actually um, uh, the second half of a paragraph, and it says, a faithless age is one in which men no longer take the trouble to wonder at all things that are wonderful and for which no rational explanation will ever be possible. So it got me thinking, and um, we sometimes uh, we sometimes think that we must understand the innermost workings of something before we believe it is true or real. And I don't think that's a bad thing in general. I mean, we should understand certain things in enough detail before committing to it, say, okay, before, say, a, a mortgage or even going in for surgery or, or a marriage. Um, however, not everything is in everyone's capacity to understand it in all the innermost details. For example, uh, how does your car actually work beyond putting gas in the tank and turning the key to go somewhere? Um, how does your computer really do what it does? Uh, how about your phone? Um, I think most people use these devices um, without a full understanding of how they really work. Um, yet when it comes to matters of faith, we expect to understand exactly uh, everything that God understands, or, or we cast it aside based on doubt that it is true or real. Um, I think if we were oh, humble... Well, oh, yeah, and I think if we would humble ourselves and realize our limited capacity to understand the supernatural, I think life would be so much better and easier. And um, so let's use the logic of if we don't understand something to some arbitrary standard we set for ourselves, uh, then we can't accept it or use it. So if we don't accept the Trinity, the resurrection, heaven and hell, etc., because of not fully understanding it, then again, let's use the same logic, then perhaps we should refrain from driving uh, the Internet or using our phones until we understand them in full detail. Um, I think belief in God is both faith and reason, not just blind faith as we are sometimes accused of. And so our understanding of God has to be trusting in what Christ told us based on our ability to put his life and words into reason. And to me, his life and words are the only thing, only things that make any sense. So um, we, we have to Greater certainty than with anything else. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, we do a lot of things on faith, uh, not because we fully yes. understand them. And so why is it in the real world, the natural world, we do things on faith, uh, but yet when it comes to belief in God, unless we have proof positive and, you know, uh, everything spelled out in detail to our satisfaction, we can't believe. Whereas, um, again, the words of Christ and his, his actions, uh, we take that uh, on faith that, uh, you know, there is a heaven and there there is a resurrection and, and all of that. So, and, but we do it with reason. We don't accept it blindly. We do it with reason, and that puts us, I think, where we need to be. That's a yeah. really good point. Yeah, I had never thought of it in that sense. Um, most of us don't don't know why exactly how much a bridge will hold and exactly how it works in an airplane, car, computer, TV, internet, whatever. And, and and we don't we don't look for the answers very persistently. But with God, people that don't believe in, in oh, yeah. God or in our faith, uh, they demand answers and they, they oh, really want to know. And it's, um, and then well, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, I would say that with things like how is a bridge held up or a car or the Internet work, it's fine if we want to look into it and find out how it works, but we don't need to. The thing with God is we do need to. The only way we're going to love him at all and love him more is to get to know him. And we get to know him through the Bible. We get to know him through the church. We get to know him through nature through reason, there's so many ways we can get to know God, and especially by just sitting and saying, God, who are you? Do you exist? And just sitting with that and really trying to talk to God. Whether or not your faith is very strong or it's very weak or it's non-existent, ask God, do you exist? Are, who are you? What are you like? So it's really this searching for God. And it's, it's a searching for truth. I mean, everybody has within them, they want the truth, whether or not they've deadened that quality within them. Every human being has that desire to know the truth, and God is the truth. And I really think that we will see, I hope and I pray, but I also believe that we will see in the coming years that people, young people, maybe older, but especially young people, are going to be searching more and more for the truth. The more that lies are piled up, on us through the major, the major ways of information, the media, um, the celebrities, um, books and newspapers and the Internet. There are so many lies going on, and I do believe the young people have already started to be very fed up. They don't want the lies. They know that the truth exists somewhere. And they're searching for it. And once they start searching for the truth, if they want the ultimate truth, they're going to go to God. And that's how we get to to a place of holiness, is to a place of loving God and believing in God, is getting to know him. But we have to do that. Whether we're devout Catholics or we're atheists, the only way to love God is to get to know him, to learn about him. Yes. Oh, that's well said, Maria. Yeah. When you said the young people, I was uh, thinking uh, like a month or two ago, I had read that the statistics are getting better for marriages. Uh, people are getting married a little later, and, and the marriages seem to be more enduring than they used to be. For um, And we have made, we have left the youth, a world that is just so messed up and they're tired of seeing families broken and and I think they're beginning to piece together why things are such a mess and in part because people don't go to God so so sometimes when people get really down in the bottom they used to say that about alcoholics you know once you've gotten down to the bottom and crashed your car and lost your family then uh, then you want to start looking for ways to repair it and um, and I guess that runs in, in that vein too yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and and then I was yeah, this morning too. I was reading the the daily gospel readings, uh, indicating that people are always looking for signs. Um, uh, are you hearing me? Are you answering my prayer? And and I got a different insight than I usually get because I'm one that looks for signs or are things looking good or are things looking bad and. You know, many times when I think they're good, they're bad, when I think things are really rotten, the next day I find out that things are really great. So um, I shouldn't be so mercurial like that up and down. Um, but the today's reading, um, I'll, I'll read uh, two sentences, goes, Jesus said to the crowd, this is a wicked generation because it looks for a sign. No sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah the prophet. As Jonah was assigned to to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. So when I was reading that, I was thinking, uh, God gave us the greatest sign that he loves you and me and everybody individually. He died for us on the cross. And if somebody does that for us, could we ask for any greater sign and should we continually nag and ask God, show me that you're helping me out in this problem here when he's given his life for us, his blood for us, uh, everything, and, and, he's given, and he continually gives himself to us in the Eucharist. So, um, so I read it this morning. I was just thinking of how uh, proud 
I am in a sense to ask Jesus to give me one more sign after he gave me absolutely everything, his, his life on the cross. So, so that was yeah, my that, take that, on signs. Yeah, that's the sign you need. That's the sign. What else? What other sign do you need beyond that one? Uh, mm-hmm. I think we we do uh, on occasion would like a little booster, but um, yeah. we all we need to do is think back to the cross, and I think that should uh, rejuvenate everything. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've thought through that, uh, and um, uh, that's why I was saying earlier that uh, the what the way. Christ lived and what he told us that was as good a sign as you can expect and really all we need um, anyone that and sometimes I keep looking for more you're absolutely yeah. right and maybe it's our human nature yeah and, and mm. here's the thing um, the, the, the uh, I've read books uh, on the subject and one of them said uh, you have to think in, of uh, Jesus in three terms, uh, and you've got to pick one. He was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And mm-hmm. a liar, most people that lie, I don't think would go to the cross. Uh, they lie mm-hmm. to benefit Good themselves. Point. And he wasn't a lunatic because he came up against the best and the brightest of his times, and he, be- and he, 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 um, he beat them all, I think in the uh, arena of ideas. And so if you eliminate a, uh, a liar and a lunatic, the only thing that's left is Lord. He was who he said he was, the Son of God. And there's the sign. And again, I, when I think back to that, that just, um, that just puts everything in its proper place. That's well said. I had uh, I had often heard the liar, lord, and lunatic, but I never carried it any further than those three words. I like. I never thought of the, if he were a liar, would he have gone to the cross? Well, I'm and preparing. As a lunatic, yeah, that's well said. Well, I'm preparing for the atheist uh, who uh, wants to debate me, and so I have to have you know the second layer of argument. Ready. Oh yeah, you do. And a sentence in the doubtful chapter is. Quote, the crucifixion answers all questions, close yeah, quote. Yeah, yeah. There and you I go. Remember, yeah, and I remember the first semester I took courses at Holy Apostles. Um, the exam question was, and I thought the instructor was insane, was relate contraception to the cross. Because all semester long, a prof- uh, the uh, uh, dear old Father Height, who's obviously deceased now, used to say, if there's anything you can't relate to the cross, and you just did, the liar, lord, a lunatic, if there's anything you can't relate to the cross, then you're missing the point. Mm-hmm. Because everything is on the cross. Okay, so mm-hmm. he said that all semester, and it went in one year and out the other, until it was time for final exams, and then he'd say, relate birth control to the cross. And I was thinking, gosh, you've got to be crazy. There's no way. And I said that for a couple of days, and then I had five days left to write a paper on that. And I said, well, I better start thinking about it really hard. And then when I started writing the paper, I, I for the first time ever, because I, need, I needed to pass, I, I kind of realized what Father Height was saying, that, uh, all, all love, all grace, everything flows from the cross to give us the fullness of life, not a cheap life, not an imitation of life. Um, mm-hmm. The quote you first said today started with, uh, uh, sin dulls in man the sense right. of the mystery of all. That was the first sentence. Right. So, um, So God doesn't want us to have a cheap life. He doesn't want us to have a cheap marriage. He doesn't want us to have superficial friendships. He wants us to have deep, intimate friendships with, with people that we meet. He wants our life to have meaning. He wants our life to have purpose. He wants us to, um, uh, 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 he wants our life to be the fulfillment of all our desires, and this is done by being good people. And when we act well, when we bring glory and honor to God, we feel good. If we do anything else, if we don't follow the road of the cross, we may be happy for a second with the devil, but we spend the rest of our lives regretting all those mistakes that we made because we were deceived by the devil. So so the cross is, is the answer to, to everything. I like um, 
and I guess that's why I liked it because now whenever I hear the word cross, I I think of my first course at Holy Apostles and that exam question I couldn't figure out. And now I relate everything in my life to the cross. And I never thought, though, of liar. If God were a liar, Jesus were a liar, he would not have walked up on the cross because... Uh, and then when you think about it, Jesus could have just wiped all of those people out and says, oh, gosh, I don't really want to go through the crucifixion today. Let me wipe wipe out all yeah. of mankind and I'm done. Yeah. So, so the cross was the most perfect way to expiate for original sins and to open the door up to heaven for us. And, and everything's at the foot of the cross. And whenever I have a problem, I always go at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I unite my sufferings with you on the cross so that you can offer them to the Father to, to save souls. And um, and sometimes now, too, I, I not only offer my sufferings, but I offer all the sufferings of the world to Jesus at the foot of the cross. I unite my sufferings with his, and I ask him to wash all of us with his the water from his side and to cover and protect all of us with his holy blood so that we can be holy and make it up to heaven. Gosh, we've got like three and a half minutes. Um, Marie and Dave, would you like to say um, a few more things before we say a, a quick prayer? Go ahead, Maria. Okay, yeah, uh, talking about our Lord going to the cross and if he were a liar, he would not do that. And just extending it to his apostles and his saints. If Christianity were a lie, who would die for it? And such awful right. death, so many of them. Right. Mm-hmm. They all, yeah, yeah, a lot of them were crucified. Yes. Yeah. And then one more last quote from St. Teresa of Avila. Oh, our, yeah. body, our body has this defect, that the more it is provided, cared for, and has comforts, the more needs and desires it finds. So oh, the I more that, that the, one. the more we get, the more we want. True. Oh, I, I never heard that one, but it makes a lot of sense, and it makes sense in relation to her reforming the convent, yes. Exactly, yes. We really yeah. search for God when we have very little, when we know that we are not in control of our lives, of our possessions, but when we think we're in control of our lives and our possessions and our lives and everything that happens to us, we don't search for him. We think we got it all. Well, that gets back to that uh, secular happiness versus a uh, faith-based happiness. Um, yes, the real yeah, joy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, One's fake and one is real. Exactly. Yeah. And this world really is not the real world. This is really a fake world because it's not, the, it's not eternity. This is just something that's lasting for a while in time. It's almost like a play that's going to be there for a few hours and then you go back to the, your real life. Well, this is not the real world. This is just a glimpse of what the real world can be like, heaven, the beauty of heaven, or the horrors of hell. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. true. And some days seem well, seem really hard and really, really tough, and it's nothing compared to the horrors of hell. You're absolutely right, Maria. Yeah, and 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 this is uh, yeah, this is the only home we know. Though, like you said, we get glimpses of it when whenever we do good and in the Eucharist, etc. And every year, you know, go by faster. <laughs> right, but you know, when eternity comes, this whole world will seem like a dream. This thing that we think is so real will seem like a a, a brief, brief dream because it will be gone. It is amazing how quick life is in contrast to eternity. It's it's, it's absolutely amazing, yeah. 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 And this is is all we know, yes. And and Charles Rich had it right, too, because he says our sufferings are so short uh, compared to to the joys of eternity, there's just no comparison, and we need to keep that in mind, keep our priorities in mind, know what our our destiny and our goal is. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think well, I think we're out of time, but uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, we got thirty Cheryl. seconds. You're right. So we'll say a quick prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this time together. Uh, thank you for your blessings. Um, thank you for your inspirations. And God, give us a heart that desires one thing alone, uh, you, dear Lord, and your pleasure. 
uh, give us a heart that loves what is good uh, so that we may do your will and bring you praise, glory, and honor in all that you do and give us the grace and the courage to do what is right. Amen. In the name of the amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Have a good amen. week, everybody. And it was great to be talking with you. God bless. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.